And uh, the, the food. Thank you. So that's uh, Wednesday night. Uh, Ray, introduce your friends. This is Dave and Ruthie Kuhn. And they're friends. Uh, Ruthie and Sarah knew each other back in Japan when they were growing up. They well, were former missionaries of Taiwan and Malaysia. Wow. Wow. Well, welcome. Welcome. Uh, Dave reminded me that we had uh, met each other shoveling uh, multiple tons of uh, of Bart at your place a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, um, what a what a great morning. Uh, we're going to be back in the Book of Acts this morning. So turn over to Acts chapter twenty five. It's a it's a lengthy passage that we're going to read because it's it's all one unit. It's all one unit, and we're going to handle it as one unit this morning. And you'll see where we're going to go with that. But this is Acts chapter 25, as we're going to see the Apostle Paul stand before <coughs> King Herod Agrippa II and his uh, sister, Bernice, and Festus, as well as a number of other people. Remember that last time that we were within Acts, we saw how that Festus had granted Paul his request to kick it up to Caesar uh, that he would be heard before Caesar rather than being sent back to Jerusalem to be tried there once again. So we pick it up in verse 13, chapter 25, and we're going to read all the way through to the end of chapter 26, so bear with me as I try to make my way through this. Now, when several days had elapsed, King Agri Agrippa and Bernice arrived in Caesarea and paid their respects to Festus. While they were spending many days there, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There's a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix. You remember, he was the former governor that Festus took his place. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders and the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it is not the custom of the Romans to hand over any man before the accused meets his accusers face to face, and has opportunity to make defense against the charges. So after they had assembled here, I did not delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought before me. When the accusers stood up, they began bringing charges against him, not of such crimes as I was expecting, but they simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate such matters, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there stand trial on these matters. But when Paul appealed to be kept in custody for, custody for the emperor's decision, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, Festus said, you shall hear him. So on the next day, when Agrippa came together with Bernice amid great pomp and entered the auditorium accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all you gentlemen here present with us, you see this man about whom all the people of the Jews appealed to me both at Jerusalem and here loudly declaring that he ought not to live any longer but I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death. And see him, since he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. Yet I have nothing definite about him to write to my Lord. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the investigation has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems absurd to me in sending a prisoner not to in indicate also the charges against him. Chapter 26, Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then all the Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at, at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. 
And now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O king, I am being accursed, accused by the Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote, literally cast my pebble against them, indicating that Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. And I was punished, and as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. And while so engaged, as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, goads were those sharpened sticks that they would use to prod oxen and cattle on their way to be slaughtered. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me." So King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light to both the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. When Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I offer words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian? And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short for a long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day, might become such as I am, except for these chains. And the king stood up, and the governor and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Let's pray for just a moment. Well, Father, even though this situation occurred all those years ago, I pray that today you would apply it freshly to our hearts as we see the passion of your servant Paul as he declared the gospel that day before the high and mighty. Lord, give us clear vision of these things, we pray. Change our lives. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. I wonder this morning, as we come to this passage, if you know what it is in your own life to experience the joy, the deep joy, of having shared the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone else, to see them actually come to faith to see a life changed. 
to see someone who was estranged from God, a broken life, actually come into a loving relationship with God as their Father through Christ. I wonder if you know that exceedingly great joy. I hope you do. Charles Spurgeon was a great evangelist. And literally, hundreds of people usually would come to faith in Christ every week through his spoken proclamation, his preaching, as well as the written ministry of his sermons. And in his book, entitled The Soul Winner, uh, which is a collection of his sermons where he's uh, encouraging people to share their faith, uh, he writes about the joy uh, uh, that of, of someone coming to Christ. He said, Never did I know perfect, overflowing, unutterable happiness of the purest and most ennobling order till I first heard of one who had sought and found the Savior through my means. I recollect the thrill of joy which went through me. No young mother ever rejoiced so much over her firstborn child. No warrior was so exultant over a hard-won victory. Oh, the joy of knowing that a sinner, once at enmity, has been reconciled to God by the Holy Spirit through the words spoken by our feeble lips. Let afflictions come, let trials be multiplied as God willeth. Still, this joy preponderates above all others. The joy that, as we preach the word, hearts are unlocked, bosoms heave with a new life, eyes weep for sin, and their tears are wiped away as they see the great substitute for sin and live. He uh, he even went further to speak about the joy that believers have in the next life, even. Listen to this. He says, Beyond all controversy, it is a joy worth worlds to win souls. And thank God, it is a joy that doesn't cease with this mortal life. It must be no small bliss. I love this. It is no small bliss as one wings his flight to the eternal throne, the wings of others fluttering at one side toward the same glory, and turning around and questioning them to hear them say, We're entering with you through the gates of pearl. You brought us to the Savior. It will be bliss beyond compare, he says to meet in yon eternal seats with those begotten of us in Christ Jesus, for whom we travailed in birth till Christ was formed in them, hope of glory. This is to have many heavens, a heaven in every one, one for Christ. Can you imagine it? I hope that we know such joy. The Apostle Paul was, of course, someone who knew such joy. He told the uh, Corinthians, he says, I've become all things to all men so that I, by all means, I might save some. And here in today's passage, in answer to Agrippa's question to him, in such a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Paul said this, he says, in a short time, in a sh- I mean, he said, uh, I would wish to God that whether in a short time or a long time, not only you, but all who hear me this day. I think that, you know, as I've been meditating upon this passage, that w- if we view this passage through the lens of the, the heart of a soul winner, that it breaks apart for us like an orange. As we see the Apostle Paul, his approach, his, his outlook, uh, his mindset as he proclaimed the gospel on that particular day. If we want to grow, if we want to grow in being more effective soul winners, we find here a number of hallmarks of such a soul winner in the Apostle Paul. So let's pay attention. Before we actually get to some of those hallmarks, again, let's be sure that we set the stage that uh, Dr. Luke sets for us within his, his, uh, his uh, book, as he's been picturing, the Apostle Paul has been like a great boxer going through a number of rounds, and still he continues to stand. Remember round one, chapter 22, is before the Jewish mob there at the temple, and still Paul stood. Round two is in chapter 23, when Paul stood before the Sanhedrin, having been punched in the mouth, and yet he still stood. 
Round, four, round three was in chapter 24, but before fickle Felix. Remember that. And then Felix continued to have Paul sit in his cell for the next couple of years, but Paul still stood. Round four is in chapter 25, verses 1 through 12, as Paul stood before Festus, who ended up granting him his right to appeal to Caesar, and Paul still stood. I'm reminded of that scene out of my favorite movie, The Gladiator, or Gladiator, where Commodus said to Maximus, he said, you simply won't die. Paul simply wouldn't die. He kept standing by the grace of God before these, before these number of hearings. And yet Festus is in a pickle. You see that he's in a pickle. He knows that the Apostle Paul is a, an innocent man, and he, he doesn't, doesn't understand the charges that the Jews have brought against him. They don't have anything worthy of putting him to death as far as he's concerned. Apostle Paul keeps speaking about this dead guy that is raised from the dead, Jesus of Nazareth. And Festus just can't wrap his mind around that. So he's in this pickle. He's, he's, uh, he's determined that he's going to send Paul on to his Lord, to Caesar, but he doesn't have anything really to say about the guy. Imagine the, imagine the brief that he would write. Prisoner's name, Paul of Tarsus. Charges against the accused. I don't know. Recommended disposition of his case. I don't know. He's going to look like a fool. And so enter into the scene, as Luke tells us here, Herod Agrippa, who is Herod Agrippa II, and his sister consort, Bernice. Luke tells us in chapter 25, verse 13, you see it over there, that they showed up there at Caesarea to greet Festus. Remember, Festus is the new kid on the block. This is a very political situation. Uh, who is Herod Agrippa? Well, Herod Agrippa was the last of the Herods uh, that we see within the Bible in biblical history. Remember, his dad, Herod Agrippa I, had been the one back in chapter 12 of Acts to actually have James the Apostle put to death. His great uncle, that is Herod Antipas, was the one who had had John the Baptist put to death. And his great-grandfather was Herod the Great, who had, had all of the Young boys, baby boys, two years old and younger, killed at Bethlehem. So he comes from a notorious, evil line of rulers. Now, Herod at this point, well, he, he, was, he was so young, he was actually 17 years of age, and so because he was so young, he was only granted the rule of some northern regions of, of, of Palestine. But yet he oversaw the temple treasury, and he was in charge of appointing the different high priests at that time. So he, he had his finger on power. He had his finger on power. Now you see in chapter 25, verse 23, that Luke tells us, after Herod Agrippa expressed his desire to hear Paul, Luke says, verse 23, so on the next day, when Agrippa came together with Bernice amid great pomp, stop there amid great pomp, together with the commanders and the prominent men of the city. Pomp, in the Greek, is the word fantasia. You can guess which of our words we get from it. We get fantastic, we get fantasy. And this was kind of a fantasy scene, if you will. It was kind of a, a very uh, pomp and circumstance kind of a pageant. You have... You have Herod Agrippa and his sister wearing their purple robes undoubtedly and, and having great pomp. And you have the commanders. Uh, it's Kiliarch in the Greek, meaning you know, ruler of a thousand. So these were the Roman tribunes, each of them ha having command of a thousand different soldiers. And you also have the leading men of the city, uh, the, the shakers and the movers of the time there at Caesarea. So it's a very pomp and circumstance and environment, yet contrasted to the scene, you have the Apostle Paul standing. Uh, in, a, in, in, in history, uh, ancient literature, we only have one description of the Apostle Paul. It comes from the Acts of Theca, where Onesiphorus describes Paul as a man short in stature, with a bald head, I like that, bowed legs, Eyebrows that met, a fairly large nose, and full of grace. That's the only physical description that we have of the Apostle Paul. And there he was, this little bow-legged, bald-headed, big-nosed guy, surrounded by all the greats. But he wasn't alone, was he? And uh, 
I see a number of seven different hallmarks of a soul winner in this passage, and we're going to move through them fairly quickly. The first of them, Mark, first of all, Mark Paul's readiness, his eagerness to proclaim Christ. Apparently, you know, he had already had his request to have the case kicked up to Caesar, <laughs> granted him. He was under no legal compulsion to have to appear on this particular day. He probably could have just sat back at his cell and said, no, I don't feel like appearing today. There's no re legal reason for me to do so. You can't do it. I'm a Roman citizen. I'm on my way to, made a, way to Rome. But yet Paul was eager and willing to come. I mean, Festus had his purpose and agenda, but Paul had his purpose and agenda on this particular day, right? And this is something that we consistently see with the Apostle Paul. When he felt good, he was ready to preach Christ. After he had been stoned, he was still ready to preach Christ. When he felt like it, he was ready to preach Christ. When he didn't feel like it, he was ready to preach Christ. Fortunately for many of us, I mean, we are ready to proclaim Christ when it's convenient. When we feel good, when we've had a good night's rest, when we feel like we have a receptive audience, yes, okay, maybe we'll open our mouth to share Christ. And yet Paul, Paul shows us here, and, and Scripture also commands us that we need to be ready at all times. Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, he said, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. In other words, when you feel like it, when you don't feel like it. When you have a receptive audience, when you have an unreceptive audience. Preach the word. Peter writes to us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, he said, Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an hope, an account for the hope gentleness and reverence be ready be ready i love this story you've heard me tell it before about martin lloyd jones one of the great preachers of the previous century uh, he uh, he preached every week there in london he preached almost every midweek evening and when he was on vacation one year and when he and beth ann went over to ireland he was walking in to visit a church on a particular Sunday, and he leans over to the preacher, the pastor, and he says, would you like me to give a word today? And the, and, and the pastor of the church looked at him like, well, I really don't want to impose on this guy. He's on vacation. But ben, Beth Ann says, oh, let him. It's what he lives for. And so it ought to be for you and I to be ready to preach Christ. That's what Paul shows us here, first of all, to be ready, to be eager to proclaim Christ. Secondly, mark Paul's graciousness in proclaiming Christ. There was a television program which was advertised with these words. Quote, my mother hates my boyfriend. We've moved 37 times in the last year, and my father is my uncle. It was the reality Animal Planet television show for the meerkats. Okay. Well, Bernice, Bernice could have made any reality television show blush. I mean, the Kardashians had nothing on Bernice. Why so? Well, Bernice was first of all married when she was either 11 or 12 years old. She was remarried when she was 13 to her uncle. At this time... She was in a full-blown, incestuous relationship with her full-blooded brother, Herod Agrippa II. So picture, this is a brother and sister who are sleeping together that Paul is going to proclaim the gospel to. Okay? She would later become the mistress of Emperor Titus, who, would be, who was the general who had sacked, uh, who had sacked Jerusalem. So it tells you what kind of a gal she was. I mean... How do you preach, how do you share the gospel with people like this? It's a good question, isn't it? You and I, though, we live increasingly in a day of uh, transsexual, bisexuals, homosexuals. I mean, the, the sky is a limit anymore. You, you, you and I never know uh, the lifestyles of people that we're going to encounter, whether someone is, is, is in the process of becoming a man or in the process of becoming a woman. We just don't know. But one of the ways you do not gain entry in preaching or sharing the gospel with someone is to, to start off, you rotten scoundrels. <laughs> you sinners. I can hardly stand to look at you. But listen to what I have to say about Jesus. Jesus. 
No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Notice the graciousness that Paul approached them with. Look again at chapter 26. Paul says this in verse 2. He says, I consider myself fortunate, literally blessed. The word is makarios. It's the word that's typically translated blessed or happy in the scripture. I consider myself happy to preach to you today. Isn't that amazing? Given the people that Paul is preaching to? Friends, remember that the fastest way to shut the door on any kind of effectiveness with anyone is to project a kind of judgmental, uh, I'm better than you attitude. Paul didn't do that. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. He says, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I'm foremost of all. Not I was, but I am. Could he, could, could Paul, would Paul consider himself a worse sinner than Bernice? Than Agrippa? Apparently so. I mean, how so? How could he do that? I love what John Stott says. Listen to this. Stott says, Paul was so vividly aware of his own sins that he couldn't conceive that anybody could be worse. It is the language of every sinner whose conscience has been awakened and disturbed by the Holy Spirit. We may begin like the Pharisee in Jesus' parable, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, but we end up like the tax collector who beat his breast said and said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Mm. So mark Paul's graciousness as he spoke to them. Thirdly, mark Paul's humility in proclaiming Christ to them. Now keep in mind, at that, at that point in history, there was probably no greater biblical scholar or expert on things related to the Jews than the Apostle Paul. <laughs> there was probably no greater expert. He had, he had been reared in Jerusalem. He, he had sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest Jewish scholars at that time. And yet he says to Agrippa, notice this once again, he says, I consider myself happy, King Agrippa, that I'm about to make my defense before you, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. That's humility. To attribute that to her. I mean, was Paul blowing smoke? Was he flattering this guy? No, he wasn't. Because he knew that given Herod Agrippa's upbringing, upbringing and his finger on things having to do with the temple and his appointment of high priest, that he was a man who was in the know. He was an objective guy who could hear Paul's case. I mean, Herod Agrippa had no, there was no love lost between him and the full-blooded Jews. And so Paul took him as being someone who could maybe hear his situation with an open mind. And just the way that he approached him with such humility. Unfortunately, many non-Christians today have a bad taste left in their mouth from those who name Christ because all too often those who name Christ come across as that they know everything that there is to know about everything and that the person they're trying to witness to doesn't know squat. I'll never forget in my own life how that I asked my pastor at the time, Dave White, to come and to try to be an influence to my dad. My dad. My dad was a State Farm insurance salesperson. And, and I just wanted Dave to show up and let my dad have it with both barrels. But what did Dave do when he showed up? He befriended my dad. He wanted to know all about my dad's business and before long, the two of them were laughing and cutting it up. And I'm thinking, you're not supposed to do that. Let them have it. <clears throat> Wrong. Wrong. And so it is that I think that it, we would go a long ways in, in being <laughs> witnesses for Christ if, if we are humble toward others. Fourthly, notice Paul's testimony in coming to Christ, in verses 4 through 23. We're not going uh, to cover this at length, uh, 
apparently, it's very clear in the book of Acts that, that Luke loved retelling Paul's testimony. And apparently, when Paul preached, he would oftentimes tell about his coming to Christ. Oftentimes. You see it in verses 4 through 23. He talked about what his life used to be like before coming to Christ and when Christ confronted him and how that he became a Christian and then what his life was like afterwards. Let me just say a few things about, about when you and I are trying to share the gospel with someone else. All too often, it's a nervous enterprise, isn't it? Uh, I mean, we're nervous in wanting to speak about the things of our Christian faith, and, and oftentimes the person that we're trying to speak to, they're, they're uncomfortable uh, about where we're wanting to try to take the conversation. And so it can be a nervous kind of a situation. But one of the, one of the ways uh, that can be very effective in sharing Christ with someone is through just telling your own personal testimony. Telling what Christ has done in your own life. Uh, it's your story. No one can take it away from you. What are some pointers that I might give you as far as telling your own personal testimony? Well, first of all, um, I would say to keep it simple. Keep it simple. Uh, we, we have to remember that when we're sharing Christ, we don't have to be the greatest theologian that there is in the world. We don't have to be a Ravi Zacharias uh, apologist. We don't need to know all of the, the, the answers to the tough questions really, of the universe. We don't need to know all that. I think about the blind man of John chapter 9, verse 25, who said this regarding Jesus. He said, whether he's a sinner, I don't know, but one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And sometimes our testimony can just be as simple as that, as far as, I used to be blind. I used to be lost. I used to be hopeless. But the Lord has given me hope. He's opened my eyes. Secondly, keep it real. Keep it real. People can sniff out an inauthentic kind of a salesman approach from a mile away, can't they? They really can. And so if you want to lessen your effectiveness with people, well, then use a lot of biblical jargon. Uh, come across as unemotional. Uh, you know, come across as kind of hard. Come across as wanting to, to really get someone to pray the sinner's prayer now. And I think that you'll close the door on your effectiveness. Rather, be yourself. Let others see that you've struggled with certain things and that you still struggle with certain things, that you still have questions about certain things, but that you do know your Savior. So keep it real. Keep it simple. Keep it real. Also, keep it measurable. Uh, I'm excited as I'm going into 2019 that, that uh, this makes 40 years ago in 1979 that the Lord saved me 40 years ago and if there's one thing that I've learned in 40 years it's this is that I can't save anyone oh I wish that I could I wish that I could um, but my responsibility and your responsibility is simply to scatter seeds little thoughts here when where you're able to yeah some if you're like me my tendency in speaking with another about Christ is I want to dump the whole load on them. Everything I know about everything. That is so unproductive. Sometimes it's just those little seeds about what, what God has done in your life and my life that can be so effective. So keep it measurable. Again, the, Paul gives us a template here as far as sharing your own testimony. And Again, just let me repeat, in verses 4 through 11, he talks about what his life was like before coming to Christ. We can do the same. What was your life like? Secondly, you see in verses 12 through 18, when it was that he was converted to Christ, how that he became a Christian. So you can do the same as well. Tell about what was going on in your life when you came to Jesus. And thirdly, you see in verses 19 through 23 that he talked about his, his post-conversion life, what he's gone on to do. And, and so we can do the same thing. Fifthly, Mark Paul's gospel focus. Mark his gospel focus. I just got to say this. I didn't tell you I was going to say this, Dwayne, but this last week, Dwayne sent me a humorous list of paraprosdokians. I'd never heard the word before. 
Do you know what a paraprosdokian is? Does anyone here know what a paraprosdokian is? Okay. So I learned something this last week, and a paraprosdokian is this. It is a figure of speech in which the latter part of a sentence catches a person by surprise, like, I would agree with you, but that would make both of us wrong. <laughs> That's a paraprosdokian, okay? And Dwayne said, be sure to read number 15, and it reads this. He says, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. Isn't that true? And we, would also, we could also say wearing a cross doesn't make you a Christian. Uh, listening to Christian radio doesn't make you a Christian. Going to church on Sunday morning doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. What makes a person a Christian? What makes a person a Christian is believing the gospel. It's believing the gospel. That, that Jesus literally died upon a cross. He died a bloody death and that he was buried. He was put in the grave for three days according to the Jewish clock and that he literally physically rose from the dead. Paul wrote to the Romans, he said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And, but here's the thing. Oftentimes you and I might tell our personal story, our testimony, and yet our testimony may not necessarily have enough gospel in it for a person to be saved. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah, we can talk about what Jesus has done in our life, what we used to be like, how we, when we were converted, and what our life has been since. But unless we share the gospel, the good news of Christ, a person doesn't have the means of being able to be saved. So we need to share the gospel, proclaim the gospel. And again, notice how that on this particular day that Paul made sure that he proclaimed the gospel. <coughs> He talked about the resurrection. Look at verse 8. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? And look over at verses 22 and 23. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying to both small and great, stating nothing by what the prophets and Moses said was going to play, take place, that the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So he preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He would have been remiss. He would have failed in his responsibility as a minister for Christ, as a missionary for Christ, if he did not proclaim the gospel of Christ. Paul was a faithful steward. He didn't shy away from speaking about the righteous judgment of God to come. He didn't, he didn't shy away from speaking about hell. Do you remember that when he was preaching to Felix, he was talking about the judgment to come and, so, and self-control, and, and Felix flipped out. He said, oh, I'll hear you later on this. I don't want to hear any more. Right? So Paul didn't shy away from that. He didn't shy away from preaching a, a bloody substitutionary sacrifice in Christ. He didn't shy away from preaching a, a literal, physical, historical resurrection of Christ. And he also didn't shy away from the biblical call of response. He didn't shy away from an emphasis upon repentance, that in receiving the gospel, a person must repent. There must be sorrow for sin, turning away from sin, hating sin, not wanting to have anything more to do with it. There must be repentance and there must be faith in Christ. Uh, res uh, 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 putting oneself completely in Christ, hoping only in Christ. He was faithful to these things. And sixthly, mark Paul's refusal to be silenced. Uh, as he's preaching along, look at verse 24. How does Festus respond? Well, Paul was saying in his own defense, Festus said in a loud, literally a mega, mega voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Mania in the Greek, from which we get our word maniac. Now, I think this is, every, this is every preacher's fear that you're preaching away, like I am here this morning, and one of you say, Pastor Barry, you're crazy. That would be a showstopper, wouldn't it? That would put a kibosh on things. And yet it's silence. I love his response. He says, verse 25, but Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. 
but I utter words of sober truth. There's a sermon there within that verse. There's a sermon as far as how to respond when you're slammed, when you're put down, when you're shamed. Paul responded graciously, oh, most excellent Festus. Wow. Festus had just called him nuts. And Festus' response is really reflective of, of a worldview of a Roman commander. I mean, he, he just could not wrap his mind around a crucified dead man rising from the dead. No. His mind only could handle things such as power, possessions, p- prestige. Those are the kind of things that computed f- for a guy like, like Festus. And it's true. I mean, those of the world, they just can't, they just can't accept those crazy Christians that will just give up everything and go on the mission field and represent Christ like William Borden. Remember William Borden was a member of the Borden family who he had a $500,000 inheritance and, and after he graduated from school he gave it all up and he was on his way to preach the gospel to the Muslims but he got spinal meningitis, he got meningitis and he died there at Egypt on his way. The world considers guys like Martin Lloyd-Jones to be crazy. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a specialist. He'd just become a specialist in the medical field. He was on his way to becoming one of the greats of that, of that time. But he gave it all up in order to become a pastor. People of our world look at someone like Tim Tebow and think that he's nuts. But praise God for someone like Tim Tebow who goes public with their faith. Well, one last seventh point. Mark Paul's yearning for conversions. Notice his yearning for conversions. Again, we hear King Agrippa say to him in verse 28, which is essentially a question or a, a rebuke. I mean, he, Paul, is, Paul is applying pressure. King Agrippa, verse 27, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, will you persuade me to become a Christian? Notice Paul's reply. I would wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as, might become such as I am except for these chains. <coughs> Remember, let me ask you this. Did Paul believe that the Lord is sovereign in salvation? Did Paul believe that the Lord most certainly will save those whom he's chosen, that he's predestined to be saved? Did he, did he believe that? Absolutely he did. He told the Romans in chapter 9, verse 16 of Romans, it says, So then it doesn't depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. So he believed that. But did that translate into a resigned unconcern for those who heard him preach? An apathy. Well, whoever's going to get saved, whoever God has chosen to save, they're going to get saved. Not at all. Absolutely not. Paul's prayer to God, his yearning, his appeal to his hearers was that they would be saved. That they would be saved. Those of you who know me know that I I believe in God's sovereignty and salvation. But there is a wrong thinking about God's sovereignty and salvation that betrays the heart of the gospel. Betrays the heart of the gospel. I don't know who God has chosen until they choose Christ. I don't know who God has predestined from the foundation of the world to come to him until they actually do. And neither do you, right? So we, we see Paul's yearning for his hearers to come to Christ. But we must a- end on this sad note, and it is a sad note. Even though Paul yearned for Herod Agrippa II's salvation and Bernice's salvation, for Festus' salvation, for the other people's salvation that were there that day, we have no indication at all. And Luke oftentimes will do this. You know that he'll, after, you know, when Paul is preached to a group, if someone gets saved, He'll note that. We have no indication from history that any of those that were there on that particular day actually came to Christ. (coughs) In fact, we have Herod Agrippa's response. In a short time, will you persuade me to become a Christian? 
The old King James renders it this way. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. We might call Herod Agrippa the almost Christian. But can you think of anything sadder? Is there anything sadder than an almost Christian? The almost Christian almost has his or her sins forgiven them forever, almost, but they're not forgiven at all. The almost Christian almost has the wrath of God against him or her satisfied by Christ's work upon the cross, almost, but now they must bear that wrath forever. The almost Christian almost is adopted into God's family where they can call him Abba, Father, almost, but they can all only call him my enemy. The almost Christian almost gets to go to heaven to be filled with joy forever, almost, but as it is, they must be in the agony of hell forever. There's nothing sad person that you've truly come to the Lord Jesus. You come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the gospel of Christ, his death, burial, resurrection, repented from sin, believing only in him, solely in him for your salvation. Don't know exactly for sure if everyone has. So I appeal to you, call upon Christ. Call upon Christ. Do not delay. Give him your heart. Give him everything that you are. Become an altogether Christian. (coughs) Lord, Lord, we thank you that it, it is your delight to save and to rescue unworthy hell-bound sinners. In fact, those are the only kind that you save. It's your delight. It's your purpose. It's your plan. It's all to your glory. It's all to your praise that you save people like that. Lord, if anyone here anyone here truly does not know that they are saved that they can now call you Abba Father Lord, we pray that you would just work within them right now and work within all of us we pray Lord that we would be more faithful witnesses in 2019 that we would consistently point to you as the only way for being saved. The hope of heaven. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your perfect word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit to apply your word to our lives. May you be honored and glorified, we pray, in the name of your Son, Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Greet someone, don't rush off.